I'm standing in front of the headquarters of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority in Washington, D.C., where administrators have recently announced a new round of fare increases on top of a massive 2010 hike that pushed rates up as much as 33 percent. Similar stories abound throughout the country, from New York to Los Angeles, from San Francisco to Baton Rouge, and the dire financial straits of many municipalities around the country have forced deep cuts beyond public transportation to social services, education, and even fire and police departments. Here in Washington, rate hikes cost public transport riders more than $109 million in 2011 alone. Much of that money is going into some of the biggest banks on Wall Street, and only recently have observers begun to figure out why. According to a recent report from the Refund Transit Coalition, more than 100 government units nationwide, transit agencies, pension funds, and municipalities, are currently tied to more than 1,100 different debt swap deals with major banks. And a large portion of those deals pegged the interest rates paid out to public sector investors to the London Interbank Offered Rate, or LIBOR. Ongoing investigations into Barclays and other major financial institutions have found that banks conspired to manipulate LIBOR as far back as 2005, resulting in massive profits for some insider traders and massive losses for thousands of investors around the world. The city of Baltimore is taking all 19 of the banks responsible for setting LIBOR to court, alleging that the suppression of LIBOR lost the city millions on its debt-swapping agreements. To explain how these agreements work, The Real News spoke with Peter Shapiro, head of the Swap Financial Group. His firm is the leading swap advisory firm in the country, and has had the city of Baltimore as a client for about a decade. Public agencies in the United States, one of their big responsibilities is, is building and maintaining infrastructure. And whether we're talking about a city government like Baltimore or a transportation agency like the MTA in New York, uh, or a water agency like the Metropolitan Water District, or uh, airport authority like the San Francisco Airport. Uh, they have big capital plant, plants that they have to build and run. They borrow all the time. The cost of capital, the cost of borrowing, is a big ingredient in their cost. They could borrow using conventional fixed rate bonds by issuing normal municipal bonds, tax exempt bonds, at one rate, or they could use a swap to produce a significantly lower rate in most markets. Here's typically how it works. Instead of issuing fixed rate bonds, they issue floating rate bonds. Those floating rate bonds are bought by investors who eagerly gobble them up, and they receive a floating rate of interest from the city. That obligation from the city is direct to the bondholder. It's, a, it's an absolute pledge. The swap is separate from that. They enter into a separate agreement, a swap agreement, with a bank. It has nothing to do with the obligation they have to the bondholders, except that it helps to convert the financial obligation that they have to live with from a floating rate to a fixed rate. They don't really want to be on the hook for floating rates because they're volatile. They go up and down unpredictably. They prefer to be in fixed rate form, but they want to do it cheaper. By entering into the swap, the bank will pay them a floating rate. That floating rate they can use to offset the floating rate they have to pay to the bondholder. And in return for getting that floating rate from the bank, they pay the bank a fixed rate. So think of it as three flows. A floating rate paid by the city to the bondholders, a floating rate received from the bank on the swap, and a floating rate paid to the bank on the swap. If you have two floating rates, one in, one out, they're supposed to neutralize each other, and what you're left with is just the fixed rate. And that fixed rate typically could be 50, 100 basis points lower than what they would be paying in the conventional fixed rate bond market. When banks conspired to keep the LIBOR rate artificially low, the LIBOR-based rate cities received from banks on swap deals shrunk well below the fixed rate they'd agreed to pay out to those banks. The LIBOR-based flow from the banks to the cities also frequently dropped below the floating rate those cities owed to municipal bondholders. That's because many of the floating rate bonds issued by municipalities to fund public infrastructure development were based not on LIBOR, but on a different rate called SIFMA, set by the Securities, Industry, and Financial Markets Association. As seen here, SIFMA, the blue line on the graph, 
jumps considerably higher than LIBOR at the peak of the financial crisis in 2008, meaning big losses for cities in the swap market. But while the cities may have lost out on these deals, according to Shapiro, the banks didn't necessarily win. It doesn't matter to the bank that the floating rate is lower. The bank doesn't make any more money off that. When the bank entered into the swap originally, when they first did it, they enter into an offsetting hedge, which replicates the exact positions on the opposite side. In effect, what they do, if Baltimore enters into a swap with the bank and is paying the bank 4% in return for receiving LIBOR, the bank has another counterparty on the other side, where the bank is paying that counterparty 390 or 385 and receiving LIBOR from that counterparty. They, ha they run what's called a matched book. They're required to do that. They have to offset every trade when they put it on. And what they do is they book that spread between the 4 and the 390 or the 4 and the 385. They book 100% of the profit on day one for the entire life of the trade, even if it's a 30-year trade. And it makes no difference if floating rates go down. Of the five banks with which Baltimore had swap agreements, three, J.P. Morgan Chase, Deutsche Bank, and UBS, sit on the board that sets LIBOR, but most commercial banks stood to gain from the artificial suppression of the rate. To author and political economist Tom Ferguson, the swap deals were downright predatory. I mean, I can't imagine why a rational being would sign what was supposed to be an insurance contract that has, in this sense, a sort of clause in it that basically leaves you just shoveling out millions of dollars just on a, on a decline in rates. That's what these guys did. It has all the looks to me of the same type of deal that you got with um, the mortgage story, where all kinds of predatory deals were in. I am quite struck, too, by uh, this. A lot of people bought floating rate notes, got hosed, made the claim successfully that, that these were, in effect, predatory, and they got out of it that way, one way or the other, after uh, 2008. I am quite struck by the differential sort of application and treatment. As far as I can tell, public sector prey don't do much when they get hosed. When the private sector folks lose money, they often go back to the people who sold them and say, buy this thing back or we're never going to do business with you again. I don't know of a single case of that in, in the public sector. And it makes me think that the whole process of decision making there uh, frankly, is a little weird. They may not want to admit they made a bad decision to begin with, and they managed to keep it secret, you know, I, with, with what one has to say, is it seems like the tacit collusion of the press. You know, the daily papers almost everywhere in almost all those cities, they didn't cover it. And in the LIBOR case, the banks are accused of pushing the rate down artificially, and there's no question, you can see it in the Financial Services Authority over in Britain. These people were talking about how derivative settlements could be made more favorable to their bank by doing by pushing the rates down. And that's what you can read. That's right. It's right in, in cold print. That's just a sample of this. We're going to get, these people were doing this a long time. Uh, the official story is from 2005 uh, on, but I mean, actually LIBOR had problems going back even in the 90s. People knew this uh, and um, I, I suspect we'll have to see how, when, how much this gets opened up. And the only way for the case to open up is through thorough investigation. The consequences may be enormous, and we'll explore them in the next part of our series. For The Real News, I'm Noah Gimbel in Washington.